forward. Brothers and sisters, there are two Bibles in the world. One is the real thing, straight from the apostles and prophets. The other is not so much a new Bible as an unbible. It removes words, phrases, and sentences. And it adds other words. God condemns both corruptions. One, this book is specifically about what is taken out. You will find out a great deal about the people who made the second Bible by what they took out. Mainly you will find out what they didn't believe. But Satan is very subtle. He will never take out every word on a topic only enough to confuse you concerning important doctrines and to make you doubt what God said. When you have a Bible changed by men, all you have are men's words. But when you have the words of God preserved in your language, you have a book like no other book. You have the book. You no longer encounter a book, you encounter a person. When you see what is missing and what is at stake, I hope you will stop trusting in the false Bible versions and trust the true and consistent Bible that has been passed down through history, which in English is known as the King James Bible. I pray that you will become confident about what God said and believe it. Every word. God bless you as you read. Table of Contents Preface Is your Bible defective? List of Bible versions and their abbreviations. What about the KJV lookalikes? Key to symbols used in this book. Part 1. Look what's missing why it matters. 1. One missing word that made Jesus a liar. 2. The unanswered question. The trip of a lifetime. 3. They took out Jesus' words. How dare they do that? For the dirty secret about italics, brackets, and footnotes. But it's in the footnotes. But it's in italics. But it's in brackets. 5. Did God inspire the original manuscripts, but not preserve them? Are copies inspired, or only the originals? What about all those other Bibles? 6. Look what's missing in Matthew and why. 7. What do they really teach your kid in Bible college? 3. Things to watch out for. Want proof? 1. Teaching you must know about. What does God say about this? 8. The root of modern Bibles. ERV and ASV. A movement of doubters. It all started with Westcott and Hort. The English Revised Version. Why was a Unitarian on the Revision Committee? What was different about the English Revised Version? The American Standard Version. What happened after Westcott and Hort? 9. The Bible becomes ecumenical. RSV, NRS, ESV. Part 2. What you should know about the 15 best known Bible versions. Can't we all just get along? The Revised Standard Version How ecumenical was the RSV? The New Revised Standard Version The English Standard Version How different is the ESV? See for yourself 10. If it looks like a duck NAS and NAU My Story the NASB, another Bible built upon a faulty foundation. What's missing from the New American Standard? Brackets in the New American Standard. The New American Standard 1995 Update. 11. The International Bibles. NIV, TNIV, and NIRV. Something for nothing? Something for everyone? Something is missing. The only... What? Today's NIV, a sneaky way to keep a promise. What's missing from the TNIV? New International Reader's Version, NIRV. What's missing from the NIRV? 12 Error Paraphrased. LB and NLT. More good intentions, with the same faulty foundation. What's missing from the Living Bible? The New Living Translation. What's missing from the New Living Translation? 13. The Pick and Choose Bible. Amp. The Amplified Bible. The verse that would not end. The reader that becomes the Bible translator. Those irritating italics.
What's missing from the Amplified Bible? Do we need a multiple choice Bible? 14. A counterfeit message. The problem with paraphrases. Getting creative with the truth. Is the message a Bible? What's missing from the message? 15. The Bible that almost was. A third foundation. The so-called majority text. The faulty foundation for the CSB. What's missing from the Holman Christian Standard? 16. How much scripture are we allowed to doubt? Part 3. What's missing from your Bible? 17. Look what's missing in 40 versions. The short list, 45 missing verses in modern Bibles. The big list, 257 verses missing text in modern Bibles. Missing titles of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's missing, Lord? What's missing, Jesus? What's missing, Christ? What's missing, Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus? What's missing, Lord Jesus Christ? Missing words concerning the Godhead. What's missing, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? What's missing, God? What's missing, the Father, of the Lord Jesus Christ? What's missing, only begotten Son? What's missing, Mary's firstborn Son? What's missing, the Son of God? What's missing, the Eternal Son? What's missing, only God is good, the Holy Spirit and man's spirit? Missing words concerning the Gospel message. What's missing? Belief in Christ for salvation. What's missing? Christ died for us. What's missing? Christ alone shed his blood to pay for our sins. What's missing? Christ's blood of the New Testament. What's missing? We are not saved by works or riches. What's missing? Repentance. What's missing? Details of Christ's mission. What's missing? Other Gospel Doctrines Missing Words Concerning Salvation and Damnation What's Missing? Words Regarding Hell What's Missing? Words Regarding the Second Coming What's Missing? Words Regarding the Resurrection of the Dead What's Missing? Words Regarding the Judgment and Eternal Punishment Missing Words Concerning Heaven and Angels What's Missing? Words Concerning Heaven What's missing? Words about the doctrine of angels. Asterisk angels of God. Asterisk Satan. Missing words concerning prayer and fasting. Other missing words of Christ. Missing historical details concerning the life of Christ and the early church. What's missing? Details from the life of Christ. What's missing? Details of the early church. Missing Doctrines of the Apostles What's Missing? Adultery What's Missing? Fornication What's Missing? Other Words God Wrote Through the Apostles and Early Church Leaders 18. What's Missing? At a Glance Chart A. Alphabetical Order by Version Chart B. In Order of the Number of Verses Affected Chart C. In Order of Date of Publication Afterward Preface. Is your Bible defective? If your Bible is not a King James Bible, it is probably missing words, phrases, and even verses. And these words, phrases, and verses are important. How important? And how can you know for sure whether your Bible is defective? That's what this book will show you. In part one, you will see how important it is that your Bible shows you every single word of God, translated correctly into your language. Your Bible is seriously flawed when those words are missing. They are no longer the words of God. They are only the words of men. You will see how many of the newer Bibles have sneaky little notes that actually place doubt in what God said. Then you will learn what is really taught to your pastors, teachers, and your children in Bible college. You will see for yourself why those students come out less sure of God's words and more filled with doubt. Many people have begun to see the errors in the NIV, but not only the NIV has errors. 
So part two will give you a quick overview of 15 of the best known Bible versions with a small sampling of what is missing in each of them. Part three is a select list of 257 verses. It will show you which of those 40 Bible versions are missing important words, phrases, and verses. You will be shocked. The point is simple. When you find out for yourself what is missing and what is at stake, you will be ready and able to discern which Bible is God's words and which are the devil's clever counterfeits. I pray you will, as I do, place your trust, not in man's opinions, but in the exact words of the living God in English, the King James Bible. You can stake your eternal destiny on it. Click for list of Bible versions and their abbreviations used in this book. What about the KJV lookalikes? Bibles that look like the KJV 3 are not covered in this book. Here's why. This book is about a single topic, words intentionally removed from the Bible. This is a horrible reality, and it reduces the words of God to the words of men. But it is only half of the equation. The other important topic is what has changed. Words mean specific things. And all through history, words have held those meanings, both in their original languages and through God-anointed translations. But beginning in the late 1800s, modern scholars have changed the meanings of words into what the Lord never meant. They changed God's words into what they think God should have said. All the Bible versions that are missing God's words also change the meanings of God's words. But many King James lookalike Bibles also fall into that trap. Bibles like the New King James Version used a Greek and Hebrew text pretty much like the King James, but they changed the meanings of words to match those corrupt Bibles listed in this book. Almost all modern Bibles, four, have changed the meanings of God's words. But that is a totally different topic. This book focuses on what is missing from God's words. Part 1. Look what's missing. Why it matters. 1. One missing word that made Jesus a liar. God is no liar. Remember these words. God is not a man, that he should lie, neither the son of man, that he should repent, hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? 5. When God says he will do or not do something, you can be sure he will keep his word. So if a Bible changes something to make God look like a liar, watch out. That is not from God, period. Believe it or not, some Bibles and perverted Greek texts actually turn our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, into a liar. See for yourself in the following story. The Lord Jesus had just spent the last few months in Galilee. The Jewish leaders wanted him dead as fast as possible. 6. The Lord knew it. But Jesus is God. He chose the time and the place of his death, not man. Yes, he was going to die at Jerusalem, but not until the exact moment he had known since the foundation of the earth. 7. So he ministered in Galilee and avoided Judea. But things were about to change. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. 8. Each year, every single Jewish male was required to attend three feasts in Jerusalem, unleavened bread, the seven days that began with the Passover feast, Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, and Tabernacles, around September-October. They were known as the Shalash Regalim, three pilgrimage festivals, dot, nine, Jesus' half-brothers, ten, James, Jose's, Simon and Judas, eleven, were packed and ready to leave. The caravan was already moving down the road. These early birds wanted to get a good room before they were all filled up. You can almost hear them calling out, Come on, let's go. Then they saw Jesus. Why wasn't he packed? He wasn't going to stay home during a required feast, was he? That wasn't like him. That goody two-shoes never acted like everyone else in the family. He never broke a rule. It was like Moses was living in their house. They didn't believe in him, 12, and were probably a little jealous of all the attention he got. 
So they did what many siblings do, they mocked their big brother. James, the next oldest, probably did most of the talking. Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. 13. Were they encouraging Jesus? Not hardly. Jesus' entire hometown of Nazareth had lost out on seeing any big miracles in their midst because of their unbelief. 14. So the brothers hadn't seen Jesus' miracles either. They had only heard stories about them, and they had their doubts. Don't let the brothers' holy speech fool you. They continued, For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, shew thyself to the world. 15. They were basically saying, you can't be a public figure and hide in secret, Jesus, sarcasm dripping from their every word. If you are able to do miracles, show the world. If thou do these things, their words echoed the words used by the tempter. If thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread, 16. If thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, 17. What could Jesus do? It looked like he had two options. Option A, stay in Galilee and break the law of Moses. Option B, go on out in public and possibly get killed by the Jewish leaders. Which would Jesus choose? According to some Bibles, this is what happened next. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee, 18. This Bible version says Jesus chose option A, to stay in Galilee and for the first time in his life, break the Jewish law that he himself had given to Moses. But wait, the story is not over. Look at the next verse. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly but in private, 19. So according to this Bible version, he didn't break the law of Moses after all. He just lied to his brothers about what he planned to do. Do you understand the doubt this Bible version creates? First it says the Lord Jesus told his brothers he was not going to the feast. So his brothers thought he was going to break the law of Moses intentionally. That's a crime against God. They would have gone down to Jerusalem thinking, Jesus broke the law? They would never again feel the same about him. Now they would object whenever anyone called him blameless or sinless. They could say, Jesus broke the law. It was all a lie. All. If this Bible version were true, that's what they would have thought all the way up to Jerusalem. But that's not. One day at the feast, they would have looked over and seen Jesus. He sneaked down into Jerusalem. Okay. They would have thought, so he didn't break the law of Moses after all. Instead, Jesus just lied to us, his own brothers. How would they ever believe him again? His own brothers would never believe him when he said that he was the way, the truth, and the life. 20. The Bible says clearly that God never lies. But this Bible makes it look like Jesus lied. So does this Bible falsely imply that Jesus is not God? That's what it says. Ouch. Do you see the trouble this defective Bible makes? The lies it pushes? How can you even call this a Bible? Don't worry. It's not the real Bible. This Bible depended on an ancient manuscript that was headed for the fireplace. That manuscript was so messed up that it was corrected by up to 10 different people over the years until they gave up on it and finally abandoned it in a desert monastery. 21. Yes, the translators of this Bible put their faith in a piece of trash and changed their Bible version to match it. That Bible also depended on the Roman Catholic Latin Vulgate. And do you know what caused all this confusion? One missing English word, three letters, 
Y-E-T, 22. Look again at that crucial verse in a complete Bible. Go ye up unto this feast, I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. 23. That is completely different. Now it makes perfect sense. Jesus wasn't going to go with his brethren, but he still intended to go. He just went in his own timing, away from the crowds, almost in secret. The next two verses back that up perfectly. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. 24. Oh, what a huge difference one little word makes. I don't know about you, but I could never trust a Bible that is based on flawed manuscripts and makes the Lord Jesus into a liar. The following 21 English Bibles are all missing that little word yet from John 7 verse 8. ASV CEV DBY DRA ESV GNB JB MOF MRC NAB NAS NOW NEB NET NJB NLT NRS REB RSV TNIV That's a lot of Bibles and they cannot be the perfect words of God. They are the imperfect words of man, but brace yourself, we're just getting started. 2. The unanswered question, the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord, 25. Does your church practice infant baptism? Probably not, why not? There is only one verse in the whole Bible that tells what must happen before someone can be baptized. But did you know that a lot of Bibles simply leave that verse out? Your pastor may have been trained on the King James Bible, so he knows it's supposed to be there. His mind may even fill in the blanks when he reads the passage from a Bible that leaves it out. But what about all the young people in the congregation who were not brought up on the King James? They might never know that this verse belongs there. And worse, they might believe all those textual notes that say it doesn't belong and end up deceived about this doctrine which is vital to Christian growth. Read the following story and see whether you think this missing verse is important. The trip of a lifetime. He had just seen Jerusalem, the priests, and even the temple itself. But only from a distance. He was bewildered. How could I be so close and yet so far away? The Jews called him Gershaiar, a proselyte of the gate. 26. He kept the ceremonial law, but he was neither baptized nor circumcised as a Jew. It was impossible because he was a eunuch. As the treasurer for Queen Candace of Ethiopia, he had just started the long trek back from Jerusalem. But in his visit, there had been stop signs all along the way. He had worshipped God but couldn't do it in the temple. He had offered burnt offerings, but no other sacrifices were allowed. He had listened to teachers, but none would come near a eunuch. This was their way of obeying the Torah, you see. 27. So there he had stood, in the court of the Gentiles, unable to take another step toward the God of Israel. But from one thing he was not hindered, reading the Holy Scriptures. On his trip home, the Ethiopian took the long desert road south toward Gaza, avoiding the path that would put him near civilization. He needed time to think, to read God's holy words. If only someone could answer my questions, he thought as he again attempted to understand the Hebrew scroll of Isaiah that he had purchased at great price from scribes in Jerusalem. Little did he know God was about to act. Earlier that day, God sent the angel of the Lord to Philip, telling him to take that same desert road in the middle of nowhere. So he walked along, wondering what God could have in store for him. Soon his question was answered. A caravan passed by and the Spirit of God said, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. So he ran up to it. And what did he hear? Isaiah 53. Praise God. He asked quickly, Understandest what thou readest? 
The eunuch answered, How can I, except some man should guide me? 28. The eunuch wanted Philip to come up and sit with him in his chariot. And he did. This Jew was different. While the eunuch marveled, Philip sat down right next to him and opened up the scriptures, preparing to read about the suffering servant. Listen to the eunuch's question. I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself, or of some other man? Philip's answer was simple. He preached unto him Jesus. 29. Jesus is the one the prophet was writing about. One question answered. As Philip preached, he gave to him the whole counsel of God. Why not? They had a long journey ahead of them. Suddenly, as the eunuch heard the commands of the resurrected Lord, 30, he shuddered. Oh no! Baptism? But as a proselyte of the gate, I'm not permitted to be baptized. Was this another stop sign? He wanted a personal relationship with the Lord God, just like the Jewish people had but now this. This was the most important question of his life. He had to ask it. Then he saw his chance, an oasis appeared almost out of nowhere. He summoned up his courage and asked the question that filled his heart. See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Then what happened? The eunuch stopped the chariot, Philip baptized him and suddenly disappeared. The end. Wait a minute. I hear you say, that's all? What was the answer to his question? Well, if you have a modern Bible version, that's all you have. Verse 37 is missing. There is no answer to the eunuch's question. 31. But if you have the King James Bible, God's preserved words in English, you know the answer from the next. Verse. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 32. The answer to his question was simple and direct. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, with all your heart. And upon his confession of faith he was baptized. Since his work there was done, God zapped Philip seventy miles away to Azotus, before the baptismal waters even cleared from the eunuch's eyes. So why is this whole verse, Acts 8 verse 37, missing from so many versions? Because from the moment the institutional church got the idea to baptize babies, they had to choose either obey the scripture and stop baptizing babies, or dump the scripture and keep their tradition. You see, this is the only verse in the Bible that says you must believe before you can be baptized. Babies aren't old enough to believe, so they don't qualify. This verse forces you to pick one, the tradition or the scripture. Unbelievably, instead of dumping their man-made doctrine, they took away the verse. Problem solved? Not quite. God was clear. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it. 33. Revelation 22 verses 18 to 19 is even more emphatic about what God thinks of those who add to or take away from his words. Yet millions of Bibles read by over a billion people do not contain this vital verse, Acts 8 verse 37. Here are 30 English Bibles that are missing Acts 8 verse 37. Bar BBE CEV CJB DBY of ESV GNB GWN HNV ICB JB Moth Message NAB NCV NEB NET NIRV NEV NJB NLT NRS NWT Phi REB RSV TNIV WNT Was a Bible you like in that list? Don't be fooled. If it's missing that important verse, ask yourself, what else is missing? 3. They took out Jesus' words. How dare they do that? 
For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory, and in his Father's, and of the holy angels. 34. My friend read the verse, but he couldn't believe his eyes. He set down the KJV and again picked up the NIV I had handed him earlier. He stared at it. He turned it over. Then he examined the spine. Are you sure this is a complete Bible? He stared at it and my King James Bible again. They took out Jesus' words. He was dumbfounded. I'm just like you. When I find out something that is really interesting, I have to share it with someone. So when? I learned that my friend Mike, a serious Bible believer, was using an NIV. I just had to show him some important words of Jesus that some enterprising scholars decided to leave out. Were those words important? Let's find out. There had been a sudden change in Jesus' ministry. Everyone saw it. For three years he had preached the gospel and healed the sick throughout Israel. But now his demeanor changed. There was a new note of determination about the Lord Jesus. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. 35. It was normal for Jewish people to travel to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. It was also typical behavior to avoid Samaria like the plague. Why? Because the Samaritans were not pure Jews. They were a mixed race. Yet Samaria was located right in the middle of the Holy Land. To avoid it, pilgrims had to go miles out of their way, crossing over to the east side of the Jordan River north of Samaria and crossing back on the south side. Jews by definition did not want to step on Samaritan land, 36, yet that is exactly what Jesus started to do. They came to a village of the Samaritans, and Jesus sent messengers ahead of him to ask permission to enter in and find lodging. But when they understood Jesus was heading for Jerusalem, they flatly refused him, 37. This got two of his disciples very angry. Here was the prophesied Messiah of Israel, the promised one, coming to their town, and they didn't even have the decency to let him lodge there for one night. The nerve of these people. James and John felt righteous anger against those Samaritans. Or so they thought. They strode up to Jesus and asked, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias, Elijah, did? 38. Hadn't James and John been listening to the words of Jesus for the last three years? Didn't they understand his plan? 39. These guys totally missed the point of Jesus coming. If they ever needed the Lord to straighten them out, it was now. So what did Jesus say? If you have an NIV or many other Bibles, you'll never find out. But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. 40. What a letdown. Don't you wish you knew what Jesus said to them? Don't you wish you had his words to them right in your hand? If you have a King James Bible, you do. But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. 41. Wow! Such a powerful statement. Jesus didn't come to destroy these people, he came to save them. Jesus' reply is why this story is in the Bible. Remove those words and the story has no punchline, no conclusion, no reason to be in the Bible. And yet, that is exactly what modern Bibles do. Those are some of Jesus' most important words on this earth. But with most modern Bibles, you would never even know he said them. These 33 English Bibles are missing Luke 9 colon 55 b 56. ASV Bar BBE CEV CJB CSB Of ESV GNB GWN CSB, ICB, ISV, JB, LB, Message, Moth, Nab, NCV, Neb, Net, NIRV, Neve, NJB, NLT, NRS, NWT, Phi, 
REB, RSV, TNIV, WNT. Brothers and sisters, it matters what is missing. 4. The dirty secret about italics, brackets, and footnotes. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. 42. But it's in the footnotes. Ask yourself, when you look at a footnote, do you think to yourself God wrote this? Or do you realize that it's only man's opinions? Seriously, if God really wrote those words, what are they doing in the footnotes? They should be in the main text. So if there are any extra Bible words in the footnotes, we already assume they're not the words of God. And when they are important words, like the ones I have been showing you, being stuck in the footnotes makes you doubt them, not believe them. On top of that, many Bibles are basic text editions. That means there are little or no footnotes in them. So, even if God's words were placed in the footnotes, many people would never read them. Besides, how many people read footnotes, anyway? But there is one thing we should always read in a Bible version. The Introduction When we pick up a Bible version, the first thing we want to do is look up old familiar verses and see what special notes and other extras are included. But to understand a modern Bible, there is something much more basic we need to do, read the introduction. That is where we find out the true meaning of the italics, brackets, and footnotes. They have different meanings in different Bibles. Don't guess. Be sure. But it's in italics. Italics mean different things, depending upon the Bible version. In the King James, they are usually a simple way to tell that the words are not literally in the Hebrew or the Greek, but are needed to make sense in English. 43. What do they mean in other Bibles? In the introduction to the Amplified Bible, we learn that italics point out. 1. Certain familiar passages now recognized as not adequately supported by the original manuscripts. This is the primary use of italics in the New Testament, so that, upon encountering italics, the reader is alerted to a matter of textual readings. 44. Did you see what they said? Italics are mostly there as an excuse to put in words that are familiar to Christians, mostly from reading the King James Bible. But the translators don't believe those words. But if they don't believe them, why don't they simply remove them? Because, brothers and sisters, if you saw all that was missing because they didn't believe it, you'd think twice about buying their Bible. So they act like hypocrites and put it in the Bible text anyway, even though they don't believe it belongs. It's weird how they are willing to lie like that. And what do they mean by the original manuscripts? We will deal with that in a bit. But it's in brackets. Brackets vary in shape and number in modern Bibles. But they are most often either single or double. They are not used in the text of the King James Bible, but you often find them in other versions. Here is the definition found in the New American Standard, NAS, and NAS 1995 update, words vary slightly between editions. Brackets in the text are around words probably not in the original writings. 45. The Holman Christian Standard Bible put it this way. In a few places in the NT, large square brackets indicate texts that the HCSB translation team and most biblical scholars today believe were not part of the original text. However, these texts have been retained in brackets in the HCSB because of their undeniable antiquity and their value for tradition and the history of NT interpretation in the church. 46. Did you notice that both of these introductions mentioned the original manuscripts? Why are they so important? Read the next chapter and find out. The Amplified Bible is also missing that important word yet from John 7 verse 8, see chapter 1, because they put it in the text, but in brackets. The following seven Bibles are also missing Acts 8 verse 37, see chapter 2, because they put it in the text, but in brackets or italics. AMP ASV CSB, ISV MRC, NAS, now. 
The following five Bibles are also missing Luke 9 colon 55 b 56, see chapter 3, because they put it in the text, but in brackets or italics. AMP, DBY, MRC, NAS. Now. 5. Did God inspire the original manuscripts, but not preserve them? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. 47. It's hard to find a Bible introduction that doesn't mention the original texts, manuscripts, or autographs. What are they? Are they important? The first time a person writes something, that is the original autograph. So when a Bible writer first penned what God put in his heart, that writing was the original autograph of that book. Everything else is a copy. Now if we had those originals stored somewhere, they would be the end of all arguments about what the autograph said. But godly people lovingly used those originals so much that they eventually disintegrated from the weather and constant use. Thank God he put it on people's hearts to copy and translate those words. 48. Are copies inspired, or only the originals? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 49. All scripture is inspired, but what does the Bible call scripture? Why? Copies of the originals, of course. In the verse above, Paul wrote to Timothy that all scripture was given by God's inspiration. But take a look at the verse before that, at what he said about what qualifies as the Holy Scriptures. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. 50. Did Timothy or his synagogue have the originals? No. He had copies of copies of copies. Then, is God saying through Paul that perfect copies are Scripture? Exactly. Jesus read from a copy of a scroll of Isaiah in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. When he finished reading, the first words he said were, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. 51. Jesus is the one who gave these words to Isaiah. So if there was a single word out of place, he would know it. But Jesus didn't correct one syllable of the words he read. And more importantly, look at what the Lord Jesus called it, Scripture, 52. So the copy Jesus read from and the copy that Timothy learned from were just as much Scripture as the originals given through the apostles and prophets. God doesn't want us running on a wild goose chase in the desert, trying to find the originals. He wants us to look for exact copies and accurate translations of those copies of His inspired words. Those are the Scripture. So when you are looking for the preserved copies of scripture, the ones that Jesus said shall not pass away, what are you looking for? Do you believe God's preserved words are a mishmash of writings that disagree with each other, lower or question the Godhood of Jesus Christ and leave the reader in doubt of basic Christian doctrine? Believe it or not, that is what some people are looking for. 53. Or are you looking for a Bible that believes Jesus is absolutely 100% God and 100% man, is clear and consistent on basic doctrines, and lifts up your faith? God did keep his promise and preserve those words all the way through history. In English, we call it the King James Bible. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. 54. And anything that takes away from those words, which God promised to preserve, is not the word of God, no matter how many times it claims to follow the original autographs. Look through history at God's faithful and persecuted people. The King James matches their Bible. What about all those? Other Bibles? These other, modern Bibles are not from this preserved line. They come from picking and choosing words from corrupt Bibles made in Alexandria, Egypt. The writers there didn't believe Jesus is God. They thought they were smarter than everyone else. So they were not afraid to remove important words, phrases, and verses found in the preserved Bible. 55. Know what happened to these Alexandrian manuscripts. The Roman Catholics used them as the foundation for their Bible. 
Then they spent nine centuries hunting down the real Bible to destroy it, but faithful Christians protected it even with their blood. When the scholars behind modern Bible versions claim they are following the original manuscripts, they are really referring to those Alexandrian manuscripts. But God promised to preserve only one Bible, not two. There is only one Bible you can stake your faith on. That Bible is the King James Bible. 6. Look what's missing in Matthew and why. Most of us know the familiar saying, Red sky at morning, sailors take warning. Red sky at night, sailors delight. In most places, that saying usually holds true. But in hotter, drier climates, it doesn't always work. So people in those climates, if they don't want to look silly, don't repeat that familiar saying there. That's exactly what happened in ancient Egypt. Those self-styled scholars, like Origen and his gang in Alexandria, came upon this well-known scripture. Matthew 16 verses 2 to 3. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering, threatening a storm. Dot 56. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? Origen must have thought, it hardly rains here, even when the morning sky is red. So he did what any self-respecting Alexandrian Bible scholar would do. He took it out of his Bible. The other Alexandrian scholars must have thought the same thing because they took it out of their Bibles, too. No harm done. It's just a little scripture. Right? Wrong. But don't worry, God had Bible believers all over the earth who kept it in, right where it belongs. But that put modern Bible translators in a bind. You see, they were taught that the best Bibles in the world, 57, were from Alexandria, Egypt. Yet it was obvious their best Bibles were horribly flawed here. What would they do? Would they remove all 32 Greek words, like their favorite Egyptian texts, which everybody would notice and maybe not buy their new Bible? Or would they put them back in, even though it proved them to be hypocrites? They thought and thought. Finally, they put back in 31 of those 32 Greek words. To this day, in their modern translations, only that one Greek word is missing. Know what it is. It translates into three familiar English words, O ye hypocrites. Isn't it ironic? Those three words reveal just what they are, hypocrites, because they ignored their own supposedly best Bibles and took out only what they themselves didn't want. Brothers and sisters, you can tell a lot about ancient and modern Bible scholars by what is missing from their Bibles. These 33 English Bibles kept Matthew 16 colon 2b3, but are still missing those three words, O ye hypocrites. Amp. ASV, BAR, BBE, CEV, CJB, CSB, DBY, DRA, OV, ESV, GNB, GWN, ICB, ISV, LB, MRC, MESSAGE, NAB, NAS, NOW, NCV, NET, NIRV, NEV, NJB, NLT, NRS, NWT, RSV, TCW, WNT. In addition, the following three English Bibles simply deleted all 32 words from Matthew 16, 2b3. Moth Neb Reb. The Amplified Bible is also missing all 32 words because they put it in the text in italics, however they removed that one offensive Greek word. Now it's time to learn what your kid is really taught in Bible college. 7. What do they really teach? Your kid in Bible college? And he, Jesus, did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. 58. Three things too. Watch out for
Most Christians think they are sending their child to a conservative Christian college. But you need be aware of what most Bible professors and some pastors are teaching your kids. Your professor may say this. God's words were inspired back when he gave them to men to write down. If he does, then you need to ask him if he believes what God said about preserving his words. Read and think about these verses for yourself. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. 59. Matthew 24 verse 35, Mark 13 verse 31, and Luke 21 verse 33, Jesus' own words. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. If Jesus' words shall not pass away, that means they exist. We can find them. If the professor believes these words, then he must believe that God has preserved his Bible somewhere. The only issue, then, is where we can find them. That is a good start. It is based upon faith. But your professor may say this. Only the original manuscripts were inspired. 60. If he does, that should raise up some big red flags. Our Christian life is based upon faith in God. 61. We trust God to keep his word. When God says he will preserve his words, we must trust him to keep that promise. But if your professor does not trust God to keep his promises, don't trust your professor. Sooner or later, that doubting professor will start questioning the words in your Bible if you use the KJV in class. If he starts saying that certain words, phrases, or verses don't belong in the text, or if he talks about the best manuscripts from Alexandria, he will be showing his true colors. You see, eventually, anybody teaching about Bible versions or ancient Bible manuscripts will trust a text from one of two cities, Antioch of Syria or Alexandria, Egypt. If you follow the trail from Antioch of Syria, you will end up with the King James Bible, God's preserved words in English. If you follow the trail from Alexandria, Egypt, you wind up with hundreds of Greek texts and English translations that will never agree with each other. Want proof? Chapter 17 lists 257 Bible verses, comparing missing words, phrases, and even whole verses among 40 different Bible versions. All of these are Alexandrian-influenced Bibles. All of them claim to use the most reliable Greek texts to decide what to take away from God's words. But almost none of them agree as to which words to remove. Following that chapter are simple charts that summarize the results. Get some Bible versions out and check those verses for yourself. If your professor lifts up your faith in God's preserved words, praise God. But if your professor tries to make you doubt God's words, even using the results of the science of textual criticism, watch out. The devil himself delights in getting us to doubt God and his words. 62. One teaching you must know about. One college student after another has fallen from his or her faith, simply from believing the results found by the supposed science of textual criticism. So what is the science of textual criticism? Textual criticism is doubt disguised as science. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, hath God said, 63. What is the secret of textual criticism? One of the earliest modern Bible critics was a guy named Johann Albrecht Bengel, 1687-1752. He made his own edition of the Greek New Testament. He also made up his own rule for figuring out what to put in or leave out of the Bible. And every textual critic has built his house of cards upon that basic rule. Proclivi scriptioni prestat ardua. That means, the harder reading is to be preferred. So if the reading doesn't make sense, contradicts other Bible verses, calls into question basic doctrines or lowers the deity of Christ, it is to be preferred. In other words, they are looking for a contradictory and inconsistent Bible. And they found it, right there in Alexandria, Egypt. Want proof? Here are the two main rules, or canons, of textual criticism. The external canon, manuscripts are to be weighed and not counted. 
This means if almost all the manuscripts in the world say one thing, and the textual critic's favorite manuscript says another thing, then he would give more weight to his favorite, usually from Alexandria, than a stack of consistent Bible texts. But wait God promised to preserve his words. The internal canon, that reading is best, which explains the others. This means if the textual critic can make up some kind of family tree to explain his favorite reading and convince others, then he would call his favorite reading best. That's not science. It's more like science falsely so-called, as God had Paul write to Timothy. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. Where does the science of textual criticism lead? Let's let a couple of textual critics speak for themselves. Kersop Lake, 1872 to 1946. After a lifetime of research and study, and after being professor of early Christian literature of Harvard University from 1914 to 1938, Kersop Lake wrote these words. In spite of the claims of Westcott and Hort and of von Sonnen, we do not know the original form of the Gospels, and it is quite likely that we never shall. 64. Frederick Cornwallis Coney Bear, 1856 to 1924. This guy had impressive credentials, fellow of the British Academy, fellow and prelector, lecturer at University College, Oxford, and doctor of theology. In his history of New Testament criticism, he lifted his nose high against Bible believers, saying, the ultimate New Testament text, if there ever was one that deserves to be so called, is forever irrecoverable. 65. Textual criticism is not an act of faith. It is an exercise in doubt and leads only to despair. What does God say about this? God had Peter write these words. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 66. In a similar way God inspired John to write, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and shew unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us winky face. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son Jesus Christ. 67. It's not that evidence makes textual critics not believe, but their disbelief leads them to create false evidence. And that false evidence, that science falsely so-called, is the science of textual criticism. Know what's missing among textual critics. Their faith. They slap on the name science when they don't want you to question them anymore. But I encourage you, question everything they say. As you read chapter 17, keep in mind two big questions. 1. Are these missing words important? 2. Why would someone take these words out of the Bible? Remember, you can learn a lot about someone by what he removes from his Bible.